Hey, if you have your Bibles, Numbers chapter 6. We're going to jump off there this morning. You know, my daughter happened to see my notes this morning, and then she kind of smiled at me. It, it was kind of like that ornery smile. And so I was like, what's up with that? And she was like, hey, Dad, does that mean it's going to be short? <laughs> Some of you get that. I'm not going to promise you one way or the other, but if you do have your bulletin, hopefully you grabbed one on the way in. If you would just take that and flip it over, that's going to be our map today. We've got our scriptures kind of lined out for us as to where we're going and encourage you just to kind of lean in, take some notes, because we're going to talk about something that uh, I think is very important, something that is going to really help us to better understand God. And we're going to look at this phrase this morning from Numbers chapter 6, and it goes like this. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord be gracious to you. We're, we're going to talk about today, just for the next few minutes, is grace. Now, be, help you be on the same page. I'm not talking about what you do before you eat your meals. Hopefully you do that, by the way. I'm talking about God's grace. And I don't know about you, but God's grace is hard to explain, and it's hard to understand. And I think the reason being for that is because God gives grace to people who don't deserve it. That doesn't make sense to me, and I don't think I'm alone, because the reason we have a problem with grace is it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense in our mind, and one of the reasons why is we like to feel anyway. We like to feel like we earn what we've been given. And you know what? We, we grow up this way thinking that what I get, I earn it. I deserve it. I worked for it. And some of you can relate to this this morning. Maybe you were in this position, or maybe you are now as a parent, but you came to your parents, or your kids come to you with straight A's on their report card, and you give them money, or grandma gives them money. You know, we, we've learned that if you're smart enough, if you're talented enough, if you're athletic enough, you can earn a scholarship. We, we've learned that, right? We, we've seen this at work, like, make the sale. If you go above and beyond, you earn the promotion. And, and we like to feel like whatever we get we earn it. But you see, God's grace flips that on its head. Because how many of you know grace isn't earned? You can't work for it. You can't earn it. Matter of fact, you don't deserve it. And I don't deserve it. That's why it's called grace. And, and we've been going through numbers, and some of you may be wondering, well, what is, what is numbers? What, what is it anyway? Well, here it is in a nutshell. The book of Numbers is simply a record of Israel's journey through the wilderness. Because if you remember, uh, shortly after they were freed from Egypt, they had an opportunity to go into the promised land. But when they heard that there was going to be trouble there, it wasn't going to be easy. When they found out that there were going to be some dangers there, they gave in to fear. And so God said, uh-oh, let's put the brakes on now. All right, I'm going to delay your entrance into the promised land for 40 years. For 40 years, you're going to have to wander around in the desert because you didn't trust me and you weren't willing to follow me. So now you're going to spend this time in the wilderness, hopefully learning how to follow me and to trust in my power instead of in your fear, and in your limitations. Are, are you with me this morning? Now, here's what's crazy about that. Israel is in the wilderness. They, they gave in the fear. They distrusted God. And do you know what God did? He drew near to them. He was still kind. He was still merciful. He was still gracious because, you see, that's what grace means. Gracious means to show favor to show mercy and kindness, but more than that, it means to dwell or to make a home with. See, Israel, in our mind, they blew it. And yet God shows up to them and says, hey, can I live with you? Can I make my home with you? Can I still be your God? Can, can I still be gracious to you? 
And I'm so thankful that these thousands of years later, the God we love and the God we serve has not changed. God is still gracious to you and to me today. He still shows kindness, and he still shows mercy and favor in our lives. And not only that, God's saying, would you open your heart to me because I want to make my home in your life. I, I want to live with you. I want to be a personal God. Is that amazing? I want to walk through life with you. That is grace. And it blows my mind. And so to help us better understand God's grace today, we're going to look at three stories. And that's why I want you to kind of follow along on your bulletin. Three stories that are going to help us not just understand God's grace, but will help us realize God's grace is amazing. How many of you are thankful for God's amazing grace today? So first story we're going to look at is in Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, and I need help this morning, so I'm going to get you guys, because you're Adam and Eve. Welcome. Glad, glad you're at church this morning, so I need you to come up here with me. We got Adam and Eve here with us today. That's the first story that we're going to look at this morning, and so Adam and Eve, they're going to go up into the garden. How many of you are grateful? We got trees up there. They're going to work the garden this morning, so, so they're up there. We, we know the story. God created Adam and Eve, you can't hide yet, Adam. Don't hide yet. You're, you're getting ahead of the story. Yeah, you're, you're ahead of the story. God creates Adam and Eve. He puts them in the garden. Says, I, I want you to work the garden. And so they're working the garden. And, and then one day, as they're by this tree, the serpent comes. Since I'm the pastor, I'll be the serpent. Okay, just seeing if you're with me. So Eve and Adam, they're, they're over by the tree, they're working, and the serpent shows up. And he says to them, hey guys, did, did God say you can't eat fruit from any of these trees? Okay. And, and then Eve says this, well, no. The only tree God said we couldn't eat from is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then the say, serpent says to them, well, you know what, that's, that's not really true. God doesn't really mean that. See, he, he understands if you eat from this tree, your eyes will be open. You'll become like God. And so they give in to temptation. They gave in to the enemy. And so the, for the very first time, now get this, for the very first time, they knew that God was displeased with them. They never experienced that before. But they knew God was displeased. They knew that they couldn't draw near to God with confidence. And so they did what they only knew they could do. Because they felt guilty, because they felt disconnected from God, because they felt shame, they went and hid. Now listen to what the Bible says. In Genesis chapter 3, show me that screen. Here's what it says. When the cool evening breezes were blowing... The man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And this is a beautiful scripture. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Where are you? Now, here's what you got to understand about grace. Grace makes the first move. That's what grace does. It makes the first move. When, when Adam and Eve kind of pushed away from God, the Bible says that God came down into the garden and he began to pursue them. Think about this. He's, he's walking through the garden. He's like, where are you? Where are you at? Come out, come out, wherever you are. But understood, God knew where they were. He knew what they had done. But grace pursues. God pursues. He, he shows up and he wants to know, hey, what went wrong? What, what happened? What, what went wrong? I, I still care about you. I still love you. I, I still want to be your God, but what went wrong? What happened? And so God's in the garden. And he's calling their name. 
And if you would just be silent for a minute, there's another name that God's calling this morning. That's your name. Because God wants to have a relationship with you. God wants to know you. He wants you to know him. He wants you to walk with him and to serve him and to follow him. And you may be here this morning like Adam and Eve, and you may feel like, you know what, that can't possibly be true because I've blown it. I mean, talk about messing up. I'm at the top of the list. God can never love me. He could never approve of me. And, and here's the amazing thing about grace. Grace says you have not gone too far. Amen. Grace says that there is hope. And there's hope this morning because through Jesus Christ, we can draw near to God. And we can receive love, mercy, grace, and help in our time of need. How many of you are thankful that in your life, God made the first move? He stepped towards you with arms open wide and says, I want to be kind. I want to be merciful. I want to walk with you and help you. Hey, let's give Adam and Eve a hand. Thank you, guys. Grace. Grace is amazing. You know, the second story is in Genesis chapter 22, and it's with Abraham and Isaac. And just quick backdrop. One day, God shows up to Abraham, and, and he says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And he says, You're gonna, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky, as in the heaven. And then, if that weren't a great picture, he says, and your descendants will be as vast as the sand on the seashore. And then God says, oh, by the way, you're going to have a son. And it shocked Abraham. Because, you see, Abraham was, was old. He, he was past that season of his life where he should have been able to have a child. And God said, no, no, no. I promise you're going to have a son. But yet, here's the crazy thing about it. 25 years later, God delivers on his promise. And Abraham and Sarah have this son, and they name him Isaac. And in Genesis 22, we find this amazing story, but honestly, it doesn't make sense. Check this out with me. Genesis chapter 22, here's part of Abraham's story. So Abraham placed wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. God said, I want you to kill your son. I want you to sacrifice Isaac. And so Abraham placed the wood on his son's shoulders, while he himself carried the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked. Isaac turned to Abraham and said, and this is a great question, by the way, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, I, I figured this out. We have the fire in the wood, the boy said, but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? I don't like this. This is not looking good, Dad. Next. God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered. And they both walked on together. And when they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Would that get your attention? Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. And here's what God says. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Don't hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. And notice what God does. Then Abraham looked up and he saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Here's what you have to understand about grace. Grace makes unexpected moves. Not only does it make the first move, it makes unexpected moves. I don't know how you look at that story,
But I look at that story and say, you know what, God, this does not make any sense at all. Like, that story is totally unexpected. Think about it. God gave you a promise, and now he's saying, okay, kill the promise. Kill it. And you're like, what? Are you sure? This doesn't make any sense to me. But that's grace. Grace makes unexpected moves. And as Abraham obeys God, the other thing that was totally unexpected was that there was a ram caught in the bushes. How many of you know that ram provided an out for Abraham? And you know what that is? A picture of grace. Because grace always makes an exchange. Grace always provides a substitute. The ram took Isaac's place. And you might be thinking, well, what does that have to do with grace? Or what does that have to do with my life? Well, here it is. The Bible says that when Jesus came to the earth, he was the perfect, spotless, sinless Lamb of God. Jesus, believe it or not, went to the cross in your place and in my place. He willingly laid down his life for you and for me and for the world. That doesn't make sense. That's crazy. And not only that, you know, you, you look at the cross, and as cruel as it was, as humiliating as it was, as painful as it was, the cross also shows us God's kindness. Did you know that? The cross shows God's love for you and God's favor for you. And it shows you God's mercy and grace towards you. But make, make no mistake about it. Jesus' death on the cross was unexpected. In the minds of people, it didn't make sense. You can even ask his disciples after he was crucified and buried. They're thinking, was this a hoax? Is he really the son of God? It didn't make sense. It was unexpected. But here's what I love. God had a plan. God had a plan. And he carried out that plan. And you know what I've heard about God? You may have heard this too. I've heard people say that God works in mysterious ways. And you know, the Bible does give some credence to that because Scripture says that when it comes to God, his ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts... They are higher than our thoughts. And so I guess you could say God works in mysterious ways, but then here's the thing. Because God is gracious, grace also works in mysterious ways. And I'm here to encourage you. You know, you, I don't know where you are in life. Maybe you're going through some difficulties. Maybe you're going through some challenges. Maybe there are some things that are happening in your life and in your mind. They don't make sense. They don't add up. But I'm here to just tell you today, God is working in your life. Because he is gracious. Because he is merciful. Because he is kind. Scripture says God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And if you will follow him, and if you will trust him, he will get you to where you need to go. But make no mistake about this. You will not understand it. It will not make sense to you. There will be many times when you go to God in prayer and you say, why? Help me understand this. Help me figure this out. And you may or may not get an answer. But what you need to know is God is gracious. And grace works in unexpected ways. He's working in your life. Will you trust him? Will you follow him? Will you serve him? And then you know the last thing I see about grace, it's in Joshua chapter 2. It has to do with a lady, and her name was Rahab. And after 40 years of wandering in the desert, Israel now is allowed to go into the promised land and take it and occupy it. But there was an obstacle in their way. And it was the city of Jericho. And so General Joshua, who's the leader of Israel, he sends in spies 
into the city of Jericho to get back some intel, to figure out what's happening there in the city. And their cover is blown while they're in there. And check out part of their story here. Joshua chapter 2, it says, Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk to them. See, they were busted. People saw them walk into Rahab's house, and so now she's trying to hide them. And so she took them up into the roof, and she covered them up with, with, uh, with hay. And while they're on the roof, here's what she says. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror, for we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Shion and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. She goes on, No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. This is great. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of all the heavens above and the earth below. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all their families. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Escape to the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days from the men searching for you. Then when you have returned, you can go on your way. Before they left, the men told her, we will be bound by the oath we have taken only if you follow these instructions, and here it is. When we come into the land, you must leave this scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. And all your family members, your father, mother, brothers, and all your relatives must be here inside the house. Whew, that's a mouthful. But here's what you need to know about grace. Not only does it make the first move, not only does it make unexpected moves, but in this story, you see that grace makes bold moves. See, Rahab helped the Israelite spies escape. And because of that, later on, she was, think about this, adopted into the Israelite community. She was a part of the Israelite community because she helped them. Now, what you need to know about Rahab is this. The deck was stacked against her. Meaning she had the wrong lifestyle. She had the wrong ethnicity. She was a pagan who worshipped pagan gods. She was a Gentile. And she also had the wrong profession. You may or may not know this, but she owned a brothel. And we look at that and think, what? I mean, talk about strike three. You're out, lady. But here's what God does. This is crazy. God meets us where we are. That is grace. And Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 5. Check this out. Here's what he says. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. You, you want to know why we have God's word? It's to show us that we need a savior. It, it's to show us that we can't get to God through good works and through our effort. The only way we can get to God is through grace. And here's what Paul says, but as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. God kept showing up. And some of you, you can think about your life for a minute. And maybe you have some flashbacks about the way you used to live and the things that you used to do. And now you can see God just kept showing up. He kept showing up. He kept stepping into your life. He kept trying to get your attention and show you that you had a need for a Savior. 
God meets us where we are. Now notice this about Rahab, though. She didn't need to change her life, hear me, to experience grace. And some of us, we think that, we believe that. You know, some people think that I'll, I'll, I'll move towards God when I clean up my life. I'll move towards God when I, when I don't have hang-ups and habits that kind of drag me down. When I, when I can get my life straight, I'll move towards God. See, Rahab didn't do that. She didn't change her life to experience grace, but here's the power of grace. When she experienced grace, her life was changed. God cleaned her up. God changed her life, turned it upside down. And Paul talks about this because as, as she is talking with the spies, she said, we heard the stories of what God did, how God delivered you and God was with you. And here's what she's saying. She's saying, I believe. I believe in the God that you serve. I believe that he alone is God. And notice what Paul writes in Romans chapter 10. Show me that slide. Here's what Paul says. For it is believing in your heart that you are made right with God. Oh, this is good. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. See, Rahab put her faith in God. And her life was changed. She was adopted into the Israelite community, which means that she got married. And if you know anything about her life, she was the mother of Boaz. Boaz married Ruth. Ruth and Boaz were the great grandparents of King David. Rahab is an ancestor of Jesus Christ. She is in the lineage of Jesus Christ because grace moved towards her, because God met her where she was, and she put her faith in him, and God changed her life. Grace makes bold moves, makes crazy moves, unexpected moves. It makes the first move. And you know, I, I heard this story. It was uh, in the 1800s, Alexander III was czar of Russia. He was known to be a harsh guy. He, he wasn't very kind and compassionate towards people. He, he persecuted Jews. He, he was ruthless. Story says that, that one day he signed this order to have this prisoner exiled for life. And here's what his order said. You can, you can read this on the screen. It said, show me that, pardon impossible, comma, to be sent to Siberia. Now, his wife, who was Maria, on the other hand, she was known to be kind. She was known to be gracious and generous towards people in need. And I don't know how this happened, but history says that somehow she received the orders that her husband had written before they were issued. And she did something that changed that prisoner's life forever. She simply moved a comma. And here's what the order said now. Pardon, comma, impossible to be sent to Siberia. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ came to the earth to move the comma in your life. See, Jesus made the first move. He made an unexpected move, and he made a bold move. And when he died on the cross, and we put our faith in him, the Bible says our sins are canceled. That when God looks at us now, we are pardoned. We are forgiven. We can have a relationship with God. Jesus made the move. Amen. And as we pray this morning, we might be thinking, well, how can I experience this grace? How, how can my life be different? How can my life change. You know, before Lisa and I got married, I was a youth pastor in a small town in Pennsylvania. And uh, my family kind of lived in Pittsburgh. And so I don't remember why we got together, but I was in Pittsburgh 
hanging out with my family. Pittsburgh was about four hours away. We were just having a good time, and then it started getting late. I needed to leave because I had to be at church the next day. So as I'm driving back to Berwick, I'm kind of tired, listening to the radio, not really paying attention. I missed my exit for I-80. And I ended up in Erie, Pennsylvania. And I was fit to be tied. I mean, I was beating myself up. I'm like, how could you be so dumb? How could you be so stupid? How did you miss your exit? And I had a decision to make. I could keep going my way. I could keep trying to do it my way. Or I could stop and turn around and go in the opposite direction. And that's what I decided to do. And a trip that should have took four hours ended up taking eight hours. But I'm here to remind some of you today, you're on an eight-hour trip. You're, you're trying to do it your way. You're, you're trying to live life on your own. And the only way we can receive grace, the Bible says, is we have to repent. Which means we have to stop. And we have to move in the opposite direction and say, God, no longer my way. I'm no longer going to serve myself. I'm no longer going to do what I want to do. My eyes are now on you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to serve you. You tell me to step, I will step. You will lead me. You will guide me. I'm here to tell you this morning, you take that step of faith. Grace will move in your life. God will turn your world upside down and he will use you in ways that you can't even imagine. But you've got to move towards him. Understand, God stopped. We're the one that's moving. Will you turn around and look to him? Will you pray with me this morning, heads bowed, eyes closed? Let me just say, I, I think some of us think, well, you know what, Pastor, great. That's a call for salvation. I'm going to offer you that. But you know what? You may have been serving the Lord for years, and I'm here to tell you, you still need grace. You still need God's kindness and God's favor in your life. We're still prone to wonder. We're still prone to drift and to try to do it our way. Some of us, we need to stop. We need to say, God, not my way, not my will be done. Your will be done. If you're here this morning and you need God's grace in your life, maybe you're, you're away from God right now. You've never made that decision to follow him, to make him the Lord and Savior of your life. Scripture says if we believe that Jesus is who he said he was, that he lived a sinless life, died, was buried, but raised from the dead, if we believe that, then we can be saved. We can walk with God and we can know God. But it's the prayer of faith. So if that's you this morning, right where you are, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer right after me. God, I, I want to be a part of your family. I want to experience your grace. I'm going to stop doing it my way. I'm turning towards you. Pray this prayer right after me, right where you are. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Forgive me for living life my way. Forgive me for doing it my way. God, now I stop and I turn to you. I open my heart to you. And I ask you to forgive me of every wrong thing I've ever done. Forgive me of my sins. God, put a brand new heart in me. A heart that desires to know you, to follow you, and to serve you. God, would you give me strength to be a brand new person. Would you clean me up on the inside and make me a part of your family? In Jesus' name. Others of you, you, you just need to stop. Maybe God's got your attention this morning. Let me just pray for you. Father God, I, I pray for your people. I sense the presence of the Holy Spirit here in this place. 
And God, I thank you for opening our eyes to your amazing, amazing grace. And God, it doesn't matter where we are in our walk with you, our journey with you. We always need your grace. We always need your forgiveness, your, your mercy, your favor in our lives. So God, right now, as you call us by name, as you speak to our hearts, as you bring situations to our mind, right now, God, we stop, we pause in your presence, and we turn to you. Our ears are open. Would you speak to us? Would you guide us? Give us direction. God, our hearts are open. Would you continue to be gracious in our life? Would you continue to change us so that we might be more like Jesus? God, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We recognize we are truly, truly, truly blessed. And it's because of your grace. God, give people traveling mercies over this holiday time. May we have a safe and happy and healthy Thanksgiving week. God, may we just continue to reflect on your blessings in our life, on your grace. In Jesus' name.